Are y'all ready for the word tonight? Yeah! Are y'all ready for the word tonight? Yeah! Very good. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> nice. Tonight we're going to start off with a question, all right? What do you do when you feel like you've encountered God, but just as soon as you leave that moment, it feels like it never happened? That's a long question. That's a what? That's a long question? Yeah. Do I need to say it again? Okay. What do you do when it feels like you've encountered God, but just as soon as you leave that moment, it feels like it never happened. And I feel like that's a question that all of us have asked God at some point in our lives, if not as recent as fusion. Okay, we had a great altar service. You know, the band is killing it. We have a great message from our special speaker, and the altar service is slamming. There's tears, there's hugging, there's chains breaking. It's amazing, right? And it completely wrecks us, and it feels like that bondage that has held us back for so long is finally completely gone. Jesus has finally done it. This is what we've prayed for. You don't want to keep doing the things that you are doing. And finally, you are free. But then you get up from that altar, and it seems like within the next moment even, all of those chains, all of that temptation, and all of that guilt is knocking on your door again. And maybe it's not just a knock. It doesn't even knock. It just comes in like a big old crashing wave. And it's just like, oh gosh, it's back. And it's like everything that you were just thanking God for was a lie. Like it never even happened. And you are left with nothing but questions. What the heck, God? Didn't, that, didn't you just do that for me? Was that all a lie? Wasn't it gone a second ago and now it's back? Don't you care about me? Is, are you even real? And if you are, are you all powerful? Because why can't you do this one stinking little thing for me? And then I'm reminded of the story of John the Baptist. While he's in prison, okay, and he's near the end of his life. So if you don't know the story of John, here's a quick little recap, okay? How many of you guys know about John the Baptist? Okay, you've heard of him at least, right? Okay, so John is Jesus' cousin whose purpose on earth was to prepare the way for the Messiah. And he baptizes people. Spoiler alert, right? He even baptized Jesus and had his own disciples. But because he was so zealous and bold with his faith with God, he was eventually thrown into prison by Herod Antipas. Y'all say Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas. Okay. John didn't care what people thought about him. All he cared about was God and spreading that message to all people. And so when Herod Antipas went and asked God or John what he thought of his new marriage to Herodias, John told him the truth. John said, your marriage goes against the law of God. God cannot bless your marriage. Now, how do you think Herod Antipas took that response? Real, real, real bad. Real bad. He threw John in prison. I told you that already, okay? He's in prison. So John's imprisonment, imprisonment happened in the beginning of John's ministry, but it was after John baptized Jesus. So things are happening really, really fast, okay? And we read that John called two of his own disciples while he was in prison. And Luke started in verse first. Luke chapter 7 started in verse 18. Okay, so here we go. The disciples of John the Baptist told John about everything Jesus was doing. And so John called for two of his disciples. And he sent them to the Lord to ask him, Are you the Messiah we've been, been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? John's two disciples found Jesus and said to him, John the, ba John the Baptist sent us to ask, Are you the Messiah we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many people from their diseases, illnesses, and evil spirits, and he restored sight to many who were blind. Then he told John's disciples, Go back to John and tell him what you have seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And he added, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. 
Are you the Messiah we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? This was a surprising question coming from John the Baptist. When Jesus approached him at the Jordan River, John couldn't contain the shout. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He knew in a moment that Jesus was the Messiah. He's known Jesus his entire life. He's only like eight months older than, God, uh, than Jesus. And so he's known Jesus his entire life. But then something shifts. And it's like a light bulb goes off in his mind. And he knows in an instant that this is the Son of God. After that, he immediately baptizes Jesus. And then he saw the sky split. The Holy Spirit then descended on Jesus. Okay, so all these things are happening, right? We know this is Jesus. It's just all this proof. That day also marked the beginning of the end of John the Baptist's ministry. From that point, he joyfully directed people away from himself to go follow Jesus. That was his whole life's mission. And now he's left to rot in prison. Of course, he expected this kind of punishment, as prophets who rebuke sinful kings don't tend to do very well after the rebuking, do they? Okay? So this is kind of a side note, and I wasn't even sure if I was going to share this with you, but Herod Antipas's, uh, like stepdaughter, I think is what the relation was, she asked him to have John the Baptist's head on a silver platter. Oh. And so guess what happened? They chopped his head off, oh. and she, he delivered it to the daughter as a gift at one of the... One of their parties. Okay? That's how, that's how good we've had it. We have it right now. Right? He preached the gospel and his head was chopped off. That's so irrelevant to what we're talking about tonight. I just felt in my spirit I needed to tell you that right now. You being ashamed to tell your friends in school about Jesus is not an excuse. You being scared or embarrassed, they're not going to chop your head off. They might stop being your friend, but it's okay. Very good, let's go back. <laughs> All right, but what he did not expect, okay, so, so he was in prison, but what he didn't expect to be faced with in prison was with, was with such doubt and fear. John didn't doubt that Jesus was the Messiah until he was in prison. But then stuck alone in his cell, all he had left were horrible, accusing, doubt-filled thoughts. And I'm sure he thought, if this is really the Messiah, why hasn't he broken me out of prison? Why hasn't he come and visited me after all I've done for him? Why is he leaving me here? What if I had been wrong? There, hasn't been, there had been many false prophets in Israel. In Israel. What, if, what made me so sure that I wasn't a false prophet? Right? I'm talking like John. What if John had led thousands astray? There had been many false messiahs before. What if Jesus was just another false messiah? So far, Jesus' ministry was nothing like what John the Baptist thought the messiah's ministry was going to look like. Could this imprisonment be God's judgment on John the Baptist? His one task was to prepare the way for the Lord. And if he had gotten that wrong, his entire ministry, his entire life, was in vain. His identity was found entirely in God. And so what would his friends and what would his disciples think if he was wrong? What if he was wrong? But you see, all he needed was to hear from Jesus again. Even with his doubts, there remained a deep, unshakable trust in who Jesus was. Jesus would tell him the truth. He just needed to hear from him again. When your identity is found in Jesus, doubt is only temporary. When your identity is found in Jesus, the circumstances that surround you become irrelevant. When your identity is found in Jesus, things that don't make sense become crystal clear to you. All you need to do is ask Jesus to speak to you again. So John sent two of his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And he was the Messiah. John was right, and Jesus was faithful. 
And Jesus is faithful to us. Through our doubts, through our sadness, he is faithful to see us through our bondage and through our guilt. And he can help you with whatever your temptation is. Whatever it is that you prayed for at the altar, whatever you sought God for, whatever chain was broken, whatever bondage you had lifted, and whatever sin had gripped your life, I know that God has been faithful to that as well. Or he will be faithful to that. And even though that moment at the altar where it feels like you've never been closer to God is over, and we're back to our everyday lives, and we're back into reality, and those sinful thoughts begin to creep back in, or maybe those friends are pulling you away from God, or maybe it's even a family member who just has zero respect for God, and they just continue to like trash church and everything that you're doing with, with church, right? Whatever it is, okay? Whatever it is, God is still faithful. And I encourage you, just like John the Baptist, even with your doubts, let there be a deep, unshakable trust in who Jesus is, no matter what your circumstances are. Jesus told you the truth in that moment where you let your sin burn at the altar. All you need is to hear from him again. So what do you do when it feels like you've encountered God, but just as soon as you leave that moment, it feels like it never happened, and you go right back to the sin that you thought was gone for good? You let it burn again. Are we seeing a the theme here? You let it burn again. You trust God and allow yourself to hear from Him again. How is it done? It is done by creating that altar experience in your life daily. We cannot rely on a band. We can't rely on a special speaker. We can't even rely on a physical altar for that experience to happen. The majority of the time in our lives, we literally do not have that. So what are we going to do? We're going to create that experience in our bedrooms. We're going to create that experience in our cars. We're going to create that experience in the shower or maybe outside in his creation, okay? You can turn music on. You can open up your Bible and just wait on the Lord. It's not a formula. It's not a science. It's just making space for God in our busy lives so that he can speak to us again. He does not always answer with the speed that we desire, nor is his answer always the deliverance that we're asking him for. But he will always send the help that is needed. His grace will always be sufficient for those who trust in him. Do we believe in that? Okay, y'all sound very confident. I want to encourage you with this tonight. When we ask questions like, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Those questions are okay to ask. Those doubts are okay to have. Do you guys understand that? It doesn't make you less of a Christian. But when you ask those questions, allow God a chance to respond. Let him have a chance. If you're asking this question and then you get, after you ask that question and you get on your phone and start scrolling or you go hang out with a friend or you do whatever else, how is God going to respond? Create that alter experience in your life daily. It's possible. Allow Jesus to speak into your life again. Create that altar daily and let the sin and that bondage that you are in burn again.